gentlemen, Robin, thank you very much for your, as always, elegant and eloquent introduction. I've heard him many times when he was running the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. And if anything, his eloquence and elegance has increased ever since he's been rehabilitated in this society here. <laughs> I'm also delighted uh, to speak uh, under the sponsorship of the Whitehead Lecture Series. John Whitehead, whom I've been privileged to know for many years, I will not talk about at length, but suffice it to say that he was, in my judgment, the best Deputy Secretary of State the United States has ever had. He should have been Secretary of State. And then finally, and the third comment, which may, however, precipitate some rapid departures from this room, uh, but I want to emphasize that I speak for myself only. I speak for no one else. The views that I express are only my views. I want to emphasize that. Well, we meet at a time, of course, when the new president is assuming office in the United States, and he's doing so in the midst of a crisis of confidence in America's capacity to exercise effective leadership in world affairs. That's a stark thought, but it is a fact. Though American leadership over the last number of decades has been essential to global stability and to global development after the United States replaced Great Britain as the key power in the world, it is still nonetheless a fact, a sad fact, that the cumulative effects of national financial self-indulgence, of an unnecessary war of our own choice, and of ethical transgressions have cumulatively discredited that leadership. And making matters worse today, we have the financial crisis. And all of that is occurring in a context of the simultaneous interaction between two very basic transforming developments on the world scene. So the picture is complex indeed. The first change concerns the surfacing of global issues pertaining to human well-being as critical international issues. And that's new in human history. Issues such as climate, environment, starvation, health, social inequality. All of these are compounding the complexity of the global context. And these issues, furthermore, are made more acute by the coincidental phenomenon of what I have called in my writings the global political awakening. This is a truly transformative event on the global scene, namely that for the first time in human history, for the first time in all of human history, almost all of mankind is politically awake, activated, politically conscious, and interactive. There are only a few pockets of humanity here or there in the remotest corners of the world which are not politically alert and interactive with the political turmoil and stirrings and aspirations around the world. And all of that is creating a worldwide surge in the quest for personal dignity and cultural respect in a diversified world, sadly accustomed for many centuries to domination by one portion of the world of another. That is an enormous change. And beyond that is interacting with still a further change, namely in the distribution of global power. It pertains to something very obvious of which we're aware, but which it is important to register. Namely, that we're living at a time of a basic shift away from the 500 years long global domination by the Atlantic powers. It is the countries that have been located on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. And let us recall them. Portugal, Spain, France, the Netherlands, Great Britain, more recently the United States, 
that have dominated world affairs. And that shift now is taking us towards Asia. It is not the end of the preeminence of the Atlantic world, but it is now the surfacing of the Pacific region, and most notably Japan, the number two economic power, and China, a putative global power that are now occupying a preeminent place in the global hierarchy. And of course, beyond them, there is the question of India's future development, though it is currently still in the wings. And it is also complicated by the reappearance of Russia, which is something to be welcomed, but a Russia which is still restless, rather unclear about its own definition, very ambivalent about its recent past, and very insecure about its place in the world. And these new and old major powers face still yet another novel reality, in some respects unprecedented. And it is that while the lethality, the lethality of their power is greater than ever, their capacity to impose control over the politically awakened masses of the world is at a historical low. I once put it rather pungently, and I was flattered that the British Foreign Secretary repeated this as follows. Namely, in earlier times, it was easier to control a million people, literally. It was easier to control a million people than physically to kill a million people. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. It is easier to kill than to control. And of course, that bears directly on the use of force, particularly by societies that are culturally alien over other societies.